Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Susan Ritchie, VP of Trade and Technology Policy at the Forum. I especially want to thank the Council General and his staff at the Consulate for co-sponsoring today's event. The U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum is a bilateral trade association representing U.S. companies doing business in India. In addition to trade and industrial work, we also work on cultural and educational issues to deepen the bilateral relationship. We wanted to host today's session bringing together the consulate and U.S. higher educational institutions because our members are large employers in India and are interested in expanding their workforce to the extent the labor market will provide. We see India's new education policy as strategically significant to our members as they plan to expand their workforce in India in the coming years. Collaboration between U.S. higher educational institutions and Indian academia is an important element to that goal. We are also partnering with Sanam S4 today, our member company who brings us expertise in the educational arena. Together, we host the U.S.-India Knowledge Exchange, an initiative focused on increasing joint research and collaboration between the two countries' educational institutions. Sanam S4 is a global market entry firm with experience in advising higher education institutions on their internationalization strategies. The firm represents over 80 universities from nine different countries, including some of the world's leading research universities from the US who have existing joint research collaboration in India. With the announcement of India's new education policy, Sanam S4 helps universities chart their strategy toward deepening their footprint in the country. Today's program is on the record and will be recorded. We invite you to ask questions and participate with our speakers today through the chat function. So again, let me thank the Council General for joining us and welcome our guests from U.S. educational institutions. At this point, I will turn the microphone over to Adrian Mutton, founder and CEO of Sonam S4, to moderate the balance of today's session. Over to you, Adrian. Thank you, Susan, and welcome to all participants to this discussion on the future of India's higher education sector and the opportunities it presents for collaboration with US institutions. To lead this discussion with me, I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Kumar, who is now serving as the Consul General for India in Chicago, and who will today address a number of stakeholders who I'm sure he would have otherwise been I'm pleased to meet in person, but we very much appreciate uh, your time and willingness to support this discussion, Ambassador Kumar. Just very briefly as an introduction, Ambassador Kumar, um, prior to his move to Chicago, um, was based in Washington, D.C. as a deputy, deputy head of mission there. I was very privileged uh, to have the opportunity of working firsthand with Ambassador Kumar uh, during what was a very intense phase of bilateral engagement both on the political front and on uh, the practical collaboration between the US and India. Uh, Ambassador Kumar was a lead member of India's diplomatic team, uh, which managed the visits of Prime Minister Modi to the United States and President Trump's visit uh, to India, both of which were tremendously successful. The government of India and Sanam S4 have partnered for a number of years on the evolution of collaboration in higher education between the United States and India. And as Susan said from the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum, we have been working aggressively on creating a platform through our US-India Knowledge Exchange to foster greater links and opportunities between US and Indian institutions. The national education policy, which was announced on July the 29th, uh, 2020, is a significant policy reform which moves India's education system forward from its previous NEP, which was designed and implemented in 1986. The reform is a sweeping attempt at revolutioning, revolutionizing the way education is delivered, served, and has a role in the international agenda of India's uh, economic and social ambitions. We were delighted to see a, a very clearly uh, articulated, well thought through policy which 
during its evolution enabled firms like SunMS4 and our number of institutional partners to contribute, to influence and to partner on uh, some of the finer details. And we look forward very much to working with the government of India on the national education policy. I will not go through the details and, and perhaps Ambassador Kumar, you'll talk, talk on some of the specifics, but um, the headlines for, for SANMS4 and the partners that we serve in India currently uh, are around the tremendous plethora of opportunities for collaboration uh, that the NEP 2020 will bring over the next 10 to 15 years in areas of, of joint academic collaboration through the mutual exchange of credits, uh, through an enhanced focus on research uh, in India and with international partners, with the ability of hybrid style partnerships through online and on-campus learning in both countries. And of course, the often talked about um, prospect of leading institutions around the world having their own wholly run and managed campuses in India. Uh, we are at the beginning of a long journey. Uh, Ambassador Kumar and I were uh, commenting prior to starting the webinar about how nice it is to be working on something that has a long-term output, uh, recognizing the short-term challenges that we are all facing. Uh, but Ambassador, you have a tremendous audience here, uh, a number of um, very committed stakeholders to the collaboration between the US and India in all aspects of education. And um, I very much uh, welcome you to this conversation. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to, uh, to your opening remarks. Um, thank you, Adrian, very much for those kind words of introduction and sort of setting the framework for our discussions. Uh, thank you, Susan, also for your opening remarks. Um, uh, and I'm delighted that so many friends of India who are invested in uh, the India-US higher education cooperation are present here today. Um, as you all know, India and US are strategic partners and today our cooperation is truly wide ranging, covering almost every facet of um, human activity. And I think the relations are really underpinned by people to people contacts. And in that broader context, presence of more than 200,000 students in India. Uh, uh, 200,000 students from India in the US uh, is a big asset as we move forward. I think people talk about $7 billion students spend annually here, but I think the, the bigger takeaway is actually in terms of flow of ideas, the experience, the lessons that they carry back home in India and become uh, actors in, in the economy and uh, other parts of uh, governance in India. Uh, so, as Adrian mentioned, we have had a new education policy unveiled on 29th of July, 20, um, uh, earlier this year. This is a truly significant development coming after 34 years when the last policy revision had taken place. And I think the, the overall, uh, from the overall perspective, the driving idea behind the new education policy is to create an education system that would be appropriate for the requirements of our economy today, and as well, and which meets our future challenges. The new education policy has introduced several new features, which make it more relevant to our contemporary challenges. The school curriculum is intended to be more flexible become more multidisciplinary and less exam focused. There is much greater emphasis on problem solving skills. And the new education policy covers a full spectrum of education from primary school to all the way up to university level education. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll focus on the higher education segment. And if we look at this space, the new policy envisages um, the role of universities in, in a radically different way uh, than what we have seen in practice over the past few decades. It, re it, call it calls for multidisciplinary approaches in education. It attempts to break down rigid distinctions between uh, academics and extracurricular um, sort of activities through internships and greater involvement in community related work. Now, as the education policy itself states, uh, 
it tries to invigorate the reinvigorate the public mission of universities and institutions of higher learning as centers that fulfill the mission of serving local communities moving beyond a narrow sort of objective of creating uh, greater opportunities for uh, employment for individual employment in terms of specific recommendations for university education system it establishes a single uh, educational regulatory body to oversee all aspects of university functioning it also talks of setting up a national research foundation uh, it introduces a four year multidisciplinary degrees but also uh, for options of uh, multiple exit options after one two or three years and also talks of allowing foreign universities to open branch campuses in india this emphasis on uh, approach which combines several disciplines research innovation job experience through internships exposure to international best practices i think we'll go a long way in in ensuring that in 10 to 15 years from now um our young uh, undergraduates and uh, youth will be more suitable not only for the myriad job opportunities across different se uh, sectors that will be available both domestically or globally but also be able to communicate more significantly to create a sort of a better uh, work environment better social environment through active involvement in research innovation and and in communities and i think here in i think the us experience is very useful um, and this is a issue that i will uh, come to a little later in my remarks um, as we move forward uh, the government is to uh, address a few operational issues uh, and as i know the various departments of government are already uh, involved in that process um, foremost of course the federal government needs to consult state governments because Uh, the two together share responsibilities for education uh, in in our democratic framework a uh, federal federal framework and uh, to start with currently our education system focuses on a few specialist areas um, we need to of course uh, set up a transition phase to allow the curriculum to become multidisciplinary which combines different disciplines together and and come up with a new course structure um the national research foundation in research under the new education policy um is uh, i think is again a very important development uh, we need to the policy itself the policy document itself recognizes that our ex our expenditure or investments in research and innovation is fairly low at 0.7% of gdp and when compared to 2.8% in the us or 4.3 in israel and there is a need to augment the uh, budget and funding so the national research foundation will uh, will not only be responsible for funding and monitoring of research but also augmenting the quality of research that is being done in india it will seek to fund research across four major disciplines sciences technology social sciences and arts and humanities the number of pursuing research uh, in india are also very low if you look at a per capita basis um the national research foundation will seek to provide a reliable base of merit based peer reviewed uh, research funding to help develop a culture of research in india while more details remain to be fleshed out in fact there is a meeting being chaired by the principal scientific advisor today you know, on this aspect one one of the most important encouraging policy shift is permitting researchers to retain intellectual property rights i think this will bring in more motivation for researchers to pursue cutting edge research uh, we also need to see this in context of university industry interface which back in india is sort of fairly limited and i think this is something that we need to courage as we move forward uh, and also on uh, the focus on entrepreneurship and the new education policy all these aspects should complement each other and again 
Okay. Uh, as I said before, and the US experience um, will be helpful. In fact, um, the, the, the objectives behind the National Research Foundation, um, I think uh, when, when the idea was being discussed, we uh, did uh, draw, I think, uh, some ideas on how the National Science Foundation in the US works, and hopefully we'll borrow more ideas as we move forward to operationalize the system. The, the section on National Research Foundation also envisages that expertise of several outstanding faculty who have since retired will be tapped as mentors. This again, I think is, is useful because we have a fairly um, broad base of such people, outstanding academics. And I think we have been underutilizing their expertise in, in trying to drive forward the you know, innovation and research that can happen in our universities. Uh, there, of course, have been some suggestions that the CSR norms uh, could perhaps be amended to permit industries to contribute to the National Research Foundation, but um, that's, a, uh, that's a thing for government to take a view on. But uh, it goes without saying that we need a, a better industry academia linkages um, in India. Now, in, in this backdrop, I think we have several short-term opportunities, uh, short to mid-term opportunities. Some, uh, some opportunities will come a little later. If, uh, so if you look at co-development of new subjects, curriculums or programs, uh, or joint research or joint supervision, I think these are areas which can be uh, sort of uh, put into effect uh, more easily and in the midterm um, uh, opening of branch campuses will perhaps come later and also i think uh, universities will draw uh, fee, uh, will draw lessons and feedback uh, as we move along uh, these days. Um, there would be greater research collaboration opportunities in areas such as um, sustainable development goals uh, this is an important uh, topic for us and uh, I think there, there is a lot of opportunity um, which exists in this sector. Uh, another will be to how, how do you adapt to the fast-paced developments in IT and technology sector? Now, it has um, two ramifications. One, of course, in, in terms of labor force, if you, have, if you are going to see is digitization and automation, um, there will be, inevitably, there will be certain types of jobs that will be lost but equally new, new types of jobs will emerge. And therefore, how do you ensure that your uh, university curriculum is flexible enough and fast enough to adapt to these changes and, and sort of be re and remain relevant? Again, inputs from industry uh, will be useful in this respect. Uh, the other, other impact would on the delivery of education itself. And I think Adrian mentioned this in his opening remarks. Uh, how does uh, this adapt, uh, adapt uh, how does uh, the education services sector adapt to fast paced changes in technology? Do we see a hybrid of uh, online platforms and classroom instruction? So that again is something um, I look forward to hearing inputs from you all. Um, but uh, we've certainly seen that COVID has sort of fast-tracked adaptation of um, our distance learning programs. Uh, or in a sense, all these virtual learning platforms are, um, should be seen in that broader context. Um, India, I just want to mention, India had, uh, has had a long history of distance learning programs. And in fact, we were the first country in 1970s to use satellite-based um, education um, communication channels to reach out to re several remote areas in India. But of course, uh, technology has much changed and there, uh, there are far more, far greater opportunities um, today. So all in all, I think uh, all these areas of collaboration uh, would improve the quality, the diversity, and relevance of university education and education and I'm, I also feel that this will help um, the U.S. also in some ways. 
Uh, in the mid to long term, we should look at opening of branch campuses in US of US universities in India. Uh, the, the, the policy document on, uh, talks about uh, opening of campuses by top 100 universities uh, in India. We, of course, need to enact a framework. The parliament would need to enact a legislative framework to facilitate such uh, entry by foreign universities. But the broad idea is to, is to carve out some sort of a special dispensation on the regulatory governance and content norms, which are on par with autonomous institutions of higher education in India. Now, uh, sitting in Chicago and in the Midwest region, I just wanted to take a minute to, uh, to see why, uh, to, to, uh, to speak why I see this area as so crucial for our uh, for our country. If you look at the broad Midwest region of the US, it was the center of manufacturing in the United States. It propelled US economic growth in the 50s, 60s, all the way to 70s, but then went into a period of a relative decline as the US economy itself shifted to a more knowledge-based economy. But if you look at the region today, it's, it's quite remarkable how the region has sort of reimagined itself and repositioned itself as a hub for advanced manufacturing. Um, there are several exciting startup hubs in Chicago and Detroit area, Indiana and other places offering B2B solutions. Uh, the reason I mention this is twofold. One, uh, it, it was held in this uh, transformation by a top rate network of universities in the Midwest. And, and therefore we have uh, sort of, we have opportunity to draw lessons for India in terms of how universities have helped, helped out in this transformation, how universities have helped out with retaining sort of communities and talent in the region and sort of arrested the, the out, outflow of that talent to other parts of the US. And, in, in one broad sense, it, it is something that we need to do in India. Uh, we, of course, are facing challenges of urbanization, but equally we need to have um, development of tier two and tier three cities and how universities will play an, play an important role uh, in that respect. And, and before I, I conclude my remarks, I want, wanted to also just acknowledge and recognize that there has been a very long history of cooperation in the higher education sector between India and the US. Uh, and the new education policy, of course, opens up more opportunities for collaboration. My own alma mater, IIT Kanpur, was set up with assistance of, of a consortium, assistance by a consortium of 10 US universities led by MIT. Um, the University of Illinois in Havana Champaign, for example, helped set up the first six agricultural colleges in India, which later combined to form two agricultural universities in Uttarakhand and, and Madhya Pradesh. Um, Purdue University set up uh, the rather remarkable library at IIT Kanpur. And, and there, there are myriad of such examples in, in terms of um, setting up of our higher education base in India. Um, in more contemporary times, I know that there are several ongoing university-to-university university collaborations um, among universities in the Midwest and back in India, uh, primarily covering student and faculty exchange, but also focusing on, on research. Um, the, the ongoing collaboration in health sector, agriculture, STEM, STEM areas, nanotechnology, so just to illustrate a few uh, sectors, uh, illustrate the type of cooperation that is being undertaken. Um, so with, with that, I, I thank you all, uh, and I look forward to uh, listening to, to ideas. I think your feedback is particularly important because uh, the government is in the process of uh, fleshing out details and, and basically uh, working out rules, regulations, legislative framework we are required to, to, uh, to provide a framework for operationalizing this new education policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kumar. That was an, an excellent summary of the opportunities uh, for US institutions and other 
uh, education stakeholders to play a part in what's going to be a, a long-term journey. Clearly, we're all dealing with some short-term challenges. Um, and of course, India from a geopolitical perspective and, and from a, 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 a student mobility perspective plays a, a very important role in um, the immediate short-term interests of a number of institutions uh, in your territory. Um, I'd like to now hand over to a number of senior representatives of institutions from your uh, region, Ambassador, who will talk to you about some of their own interests in India, uh, some of which you've already mentioned, I'm glad to hear, uh, and they will um, provide some, some remarks about their interests in uh, further collaboration in India and then uh, post these remarks we will open up for some Q&A um, time permitting. So um, if I may introduce Dheeraj Mera um, from the University of Notre Dame. Um, Dheeraj if you please unmute yourself. Uh, greetings Ambassador Kumar from the Mumbai Global Center of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I would like to first welcome you uh, to this lovely gathering and uh, I really look forward to seeing you to my next visit to the US since I am based out of India. Uh, as you may be aware, our university is a well-respected and highly regarded research university uh, situated in South Bend, Indiana. That's about 90 miles southeast of Chicago. It was founded in 1842 by Father Edward Sor Soren of the Congregation of the Holy Cross. And the university's mission has always been dedicated to advancing knowledge and creating a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good. Something that I see a lot, you know, reflected in uh, what India is trying to do with the national education policy as well. Uh, as a global institution, we have been inviting students from India since 1925, uh, when the first Indian student actually attended the university. And our leadership has been actively engaged with India for about a half a century now. Uh, with the mission of a sustained academic engagement with India, we founded the Mumbai Global Center, for which I am the director, in January of 2016. And since then, we've seen the population of our Indian students on campus really be the fastest growing amongst all our international enrollments with about a 65% increase in these past four years. Uh, we've also, over these past few years, built partnerships and programs with leading research institutions in India. Uh, several of the IITs uh, are also in part of this list, where our faculty and students visit India for research and learning. Uh, we see about 100 members of our community visit India annually from short term all the way through to semester and, academic, and annual exchanges. Uh, with an eye on the future, uh, the University of Notre Dame has been expanding our geographic and academic footprint in India. And with the implementation of the national education policy soon, uh, we are excited for the new opportunities for collaboration with our peers in India. My personal philosophy in life is to be mindful, dedicated, caring, and honest. And I think these words exemplify my belief in what Notre Dame presents to India through the Mumbai Global Center. Ambassador Kumar, I extend a heartfelt welcome to you as the Consul General of India and Chicago. And I really do hope that during your stint in Chicago, you do take that 90 mile journey and visit us at the university during your stay in this windy city. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Raj. If I may pass on to Dr. Kumar Yelamathi from the University of Central Michigan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Adrian Mutton and Sanam S4 for allowing us to speak uh, with uh, the Honorable Consulate General. Uh, welcome, Honorary, Honorary Consulate General. First, let me thank you for taking the time and the effort uh, to share many of the wonderful and strategic initiatives happening between India, my birth home, and US, my adopted home. It's a pleasure and exciting to hear about all these initiatives happening in India. To introduce myself, I am Kumar Yalamathi. I'm the director for the School of Engineering and Technology at Central Michigan University. And Central Michigan University is a teaching university at heart, progressively research driven, and currently a comprehensive university. Uh, this was established over 125 years ago 
as a teaching university and has progressively developed to uh, meet the needs of the current generation. So we offer programs from science to engineering, business to finance, arts to humanities across a spectrum to prepare the future generation. We do have a strong foothold in connection with the industry, engaging in cutting edge research, and most importantly, translating all this knowledge to educational experiences for our students. We have called the name as a comprehensive university and our engineering programs are relatively young, but we are ranked at 52 across the country. And CMU's engineering programs are ranked the best in Michigan in terms of the average starting salaries and the lowest debt of students by the time of graduation. And our graduates are highly sought out by industry and academia alike. And we have a placement of almost 100%. Yet, we still have a long way to go. And we see that Indian universities as a strategic partner to get there. As we see that they have already pioneered several efforts. As you said, uh, Council Kumar is like frugal innovation, agriculture technology, water technology, even distance education. And most importantly, broader adoption of STEM disciplines among the Generation Z. Some of our strategic partnerships with Indian universities include uh, one plus one programs at the graduate level in engineering, business, two plus two programs, uh, joint teaching initiatives between both universities, joint real-time team teaching, study abroad, study student exchange, faculty sabbaticals and all. And these partnerships we believe allows us to exchange knowledge of challenges faced by students and faculty alike. It helps us share the resources such as equipment and expertise, learn how to boost and transform the research ecosystem at both universities, lead to new intellectual development, uh, intellectual property development, better connect industry and academia alike, and help us make the research space more dynamic and most importantly, prepare the global citizens of the future. And lastly, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite Honorable Consulate General to visit Central Michigan University sometime in the near future, hopefully after the current pandemic subsides, hopefully in the next few months. We like to present to you the cutting edge research, design innovations, and pedagogies happening at CMU, and yet also learn from him on how to better partner and serve the universities and colleges in India. Thank you. Thank you, Kumar. If I may hand over to Dr. Retu Mabukela of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Good morning, Ambassador Kumar. Welcome to Chicago and welcome to the Midwest. Adrian, thank you so much for inviting uh, our university to be a part of the conversation and to warmly welcome Ambassador Kumar. The, I'm Ritu Mabukela, Vice Provost for International Affairs and Global Strategies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We're a short 125 miles south of Chicago and so we really do look forward to welcoming you to our campus as my other colleagues have conveyed to their respective campuses when things and, uh, and conditions permit. Uh, the University of Illinois, as you correctly noted, uh, Ambassador, in your remarks, has been very actively engaged um, in India and in international work, broadly speaking, for more than a century. Uh, in the past year, we had the highest number of international students of any public institution in the U.S. with more than 10,000 international students on our campus and another 2,500 or so visiting scholars. Our faculty members are, very, are actively engaged in a variety of international um, initiatives and the university in particular um, has been um, investing quite heavily in research, um, including in India. Um, in the past year, we had expenditures of more than $652 million 
in uh, research activity, um, of which about 136 million uh, came from the National Science Foundation. We are quite proud that uh, we have the third largest library in, um, in the US. Um, so uh, when, if you have an opportunity to come and visit, we would very uh, be proud to uh, share some of the collections that we have with you, some of which really focus quite heavily on our international work, as we also happen to have uh, one of the largest international and area studies libraries in the country with more than 2 million volumes. With respect to our particular engagement in India this past academic year, we welcomed more than 1,400 um, students from India in particular, and the colleges that you identified, our College of Agriculture in particular, as well as of our, our College of um, Engineering and Liberal Arts and Sciences, are home to the majority of these students. Of this number, five, a little over uh, 500 were undergraduate students and almost 900 were graduate students, um, in, enrolled in a variety of um, academic programs. One of the things that we've done fairly actively in the, um, over our time in our engagement with India is pr pursue active collaborative relationships in areas uh, ranging from student exchanges to faculty research to corporate, corporate um, education arrangements where we have students flowing in an exchange of ideas flowing in both directions from um, Urbana to India as well as India to Urbana. We're very proud that we have hosted um, Fulbright scholars coming from India on our campus, as well as sent our own faculty members to India to engage in um, scholarly research in the exchange of ideas. Now, the University of Illinois at Urbana is one of three in Illinois universities. Um, our Ill University of Illinois system is comprised of our campus here in Urbana-Champaign, uh, our sister campus in Chicago, as well as our sister uh, campus in Springfield. So these three institutions constitute uh, the University of Illinois system. And the uh, president of our system, President Killeen, uh, during his tenure has visited India at least three times. And um, if we had not, if our plans had not been thwarted by Corona, we would have visited with our chancellor of the Urbana campus to India in October. But we know that this is a temporary pause. We will have an opportunity to visit in the future. In terms of our future engagement, uh, we are actively engaged even during this um, uh, period of the pandemic in virtual exchange through research, through scholarly uh, collaboration with our partners in India. And while uh, we, we are doing international work, perhaps in ways in which we have not historically done it, um, our engagement continues and it is quite robust. We look forward to welcoming you to our campus and um, sharing and, show, um, and showcasing some of the wonderful work that we're doing. And we look forward to returning to India as soon as uh, conditions on the ground permit. Welcome to the Midwest and welcome to Chicago. Thank you very much, uh, Reitu. And if I may finally hand over to Dan Hurtleman from Purdue. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, okay. Well, first, uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Adrian, for putting this uh, program together. Um, Purdue has only two nation, national partners, India and Colombia. So we made an institutional commitment to focusing on India. Uh, that links back to our strategic planning, which uh, has transformative education, of course, and world-changing research and online education and STEM leadership, but it also has affordability and accessibility. So you may know we've held tuition constant for nine straight years at Purdue, and this fall hit our largest number of students ever, 46,000 on uh, fully full-time enrolled in the, in the fall. So to do all the things we want to do, hold tuition constant, with flat state budget, it's all about partnerships. So my position is Chief Officer Corporate and Global Partnerships. We, um, over the years, as, as, as the ambassador said, we've done what we think are, are, are good contributions uh, to Indian institutions. We have some partnerships uh, these days. 
We also have 2,000. So 1% of your students are at Purdue University right now. And that's about half and half grads and undergrads. We have 265 faculty of Indian origin. So very large, uh, we have about 2,000 faculty. So that's a large uh, contingent. And so that, that's part of the entire foundation that how we've built this partnership. It's been going seven years and my colleague Heidi Arola is the director of that. She's on the call today too as well. Um, if we look at some of the, uh, I'll, I'll talk about a few of the programs we've done in the past and then link it back to the new uh, NRF, the NEP. Uh, we work across a wide variety of, of uh, modalities. We have an undergraduate research program. It's, uh, it's called PURE. It's been going for five years. We basically recruit from ITB, IIT uh, Madras, and, and uh, Hyderabad undergrad students to come to the states in their before their senior year and work on research with the faculty. We have between 25 and 40 doing that for those years. So that's worked out really well as they build relationships with those three universities. We're in the second year of a unique partnership, uh, exclusive one with uh, Science and Engineering Research Board, CERB. So we had 25 scholars per year coming to Purdue but this is from universities all across India. But to be accepted into this program, it involves uh, a faculty member there and a faculty member at Purdue from whatever university connecting on a research topic. And so uh, we're in our, going into our second year, but the results of the first year have been amazing with a couple of papers per, per person already as just based on a year at, at, on campus at Purdue working in the research labs here. We are also grateful to Sanam Four, who we're helping uh, connecting us up with uh, the Ministry of Human Resource Development recently. And so they, uh, we have a, a programs with Andhra University and SVU uh, on Pradesh uh, that involves entrepreneurship and innovation. Those are things that we think we do well, and we're interested in expanding our work with uh, around the world, including with India, in in capacity building for entrepreneurship and innovation. So I noted, Ambassador, that you mentioned that as one of the potential focus areas. For, um, you know, you know, um, corporate partnerships is another big uh, aspect of what we do. Uh, and so we have two major ones with India. Emphasis is one. Uh, they, they have a good sized presence going in the States these days. We have a, uh, a large contract with them to do cybersecurity education. We develop material for all of their freshers. We have, at the other extreme, we have a, a, a domain expert emphasis, identifies who they think their cyber domain experts are, or they come to Purdue, we work with the cyber range. And so, um, very interesting set of engagements with emphasis. Uh, as you know, they have a presence in, in, in the States as well. Uh, Dr. Reddy's Labs, uh, the, the founder and, and well, the leaders right now are, are Purdue alums. So we have actually a, a PhD fellowship program with them where they identify top two non-PhD candidates out of their 100,000 person lab and send them to Purdue for a PhD. So we're thrilled with that. We'd like to do more corporate partnerships with uh, Purdue. And the very last thing I'll say is, is the one thing we haven't done, we, we have these good relationships, but we've never quite gone together with one of our partners in India, gone after a big research project with joint funding or a company. So we've, we've done a lot of the, the, the individual things, but so I think, uh, you know, we'd be thrilled about pulling, uh, you know, shared NSF funding from the States, shared NRF funding from India, two universities and a corporation one plus one plus one equals five or something, right? We, that's the sort of thing we think we can create and uh, so we'd love to participate in that and, and have that discussion going forward. So again, thanks for your time. I uh, appreciate being here, being a part of this. Thank you very much, Dan, and, and to the other representatives. Uh, some uh, excellent testimonies of uh, the engagement, deep engagement, historical engagement, 
and the ambitions for future engagement ambassador from institutions in your region. Uh, I wonder if you just had a few comments uh, to respond uh, to those who've just spoken. Yes, uh, as you rightly say, I think um, uh, we have heard some very useful comments. Of course, it's also a testimony to um, how invested um, institutes of higher education and universities here in, in India and the potential that they see for future cooperation. Uh, of course, I would uh, love to visit these campuses um, uh, at an early date, um, I have already been to Purdue University briefly, but um, I, I wish to uh, visit Purdue again for a, uh, for a more extensive discussion and other universities. Um, I think, as uh, I think, uh, Mr. Yelamu, uh, I think Dr. Yelamarthi talked about a few. Uh, areas, water technology, frugal, frugal uh, innovation, STEM disciplines, where there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, I think in terms of in terms of ideas that have come out, uh, I think this this issue of joint funding for research in India is an important one, and I think um, it is. I've touched upon it in uh, in my remarks here. So you you could possibly conceive of a of a a uh, framework where you draw in research, uh, funding from industry, from universities, and some from NRF, the National Research Foundation. I think that would be one, one way of looking at it. Um, it was interesting, of course, to hear from uh, the University of Notre Dame about the first, first Indian students and, uh, coming to the university in 1925. Um, I think it's, it's of course um, important to know this history, uh, and uh, I will just mention that Miss um, uh, Hedi Arola, who is on the call here from Purdue University, had shared a very fascinating blog on on India uh, India connection of Purdue University and how some civil engineers came in 1905 from different parts of India, including from Jammu and Kashmir, and went back and, and were engaged in, in civil works um, in India. Uh, so this, I think it's important to, to have this sense of history of what has happened in the past while we look forward to future collaboration. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll through you and, and directly with the different universities, we, we will look at um, uh, opportunities to further, uh, to, to see how we further uh, deepen this collaboration. Uh, I did not talk about um, transfer of credits uh, in uh, the issue of transfer of credits. So uh, I think as of now, it was uh, very limited opportunities. Uh, I think some of the IITs had this facility of exchange programs with universities in the US. But this, um, I think this opportunity to have your credits transferred from say a semester studying in the US towards your final degree that you earn in India, I think is, is again a useful um, step that the government has taken. And, uh, I think in our journey towards uh, a stage where we look at uh, a joint degree program, I think these will be the building blocks uh, towards that eventual step. We can look at that also. In some ways, what Infosys has done in, in Purdue University in, in setting up a cybersecurity uh, to develop the curriculum for cybersecurity and to extend the support uh, is the type of thing I think we are looking from corporate sector in India. Uh, we, of course, again, uh, draw in lessons from the U.S. and to put together a framework that allows uh, that autonomy to universities uh, in terms of decision-making and, uh, and benefit from that closer academia industry linkage. So, again, these, as uh, I uh, sort of keep harping, I think the, experience, the sharing of experiences and best practices is something which is very important for us as we embark on this exciting prospect of making our university education much more responsive to the needs of times. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we have a number of questions in the chat box that we may not get time to address specifically. You've given some very good um, remarks to many of them um, in your response. Uh, so for those of you that do have questions, we will um, provide between us a consolidated set of responses. But I want to highlight something that the ambassador said is that, um, that whilst the policy has been announced, the government is still very open to hearing feedback as it looks to implement the, the framework, the legislation and the implementation uh, of this policy. And this is the second webinar um, that we've delivered uh, in partnership with the government of India in the United States. We uh, did one with the um, new Consul General in New York several weeks ago. And we've had a tremendous response from institutions uh, in the New York region uh, contributing to that constructive dialogue. And our aim is very much to put some of those uh, recommendations in detail across to the government of India. And I know Ambassador, you and your team are committed to uh, endorsing those recommendations um, to your colleagues in, in Delhi. A couple of points that I, I would like to just hear your feedback on. Clearly, um, as you suggested, India in the 70s uh, embarked on a digitization of education to be able to reach uh, the masses. And um, now, of course, digitization of, of um, education in all its forms has become an absolute compulsory uh, outcome for, for all uh, those that are studying. How do you see that evolving over the next 12 to 24 months and, and what role specifically do you see US partners can play in the digitization, of not just the technology, but the content uh, of, of learning that um, India will need in, in great depth and breadth? This, this is a, a very interesting question. Um, so, I think the increasing digitization that, um, digitization that we are seeing all around uh, will naturally also impact on on the education sector. And I, I think it, in terms of delivery of content, um, uh, I think the, the notion of uh, uh, guest, le guest lectures by eminent faculty from around the world is something which, which if you look at a digital format, I think is probably uh, more easy to implement. So that is that is one one way of doing it. But what is what is very interesting is uh, how online platforms are allowing you to virtually conduct lab experiments. So this is another area where I think there will be opportunities. And I say this because my um, uh, my son had this uh, experience of doing a summer program on biotechnology virtually with the University of Chicago. And I was amazed at the, at the level and sophistication of uh, virtual platforms that uh, are available for to allow to get a fairly close experience of, of a lab, uh, how advanced lab might function. And so this is another area. Uh, but in, in, in the Indian context, if you move away from the higher education space, and I think there is opportunity for US uh, companies and of course for our own IT companies is to expand both content uh, and improve delivery of that content in regional languages in India. I think we need to recognize that um, very, if you look at absolute numbers, uh, so out of a population of 1.3 billion, uh, we would have probably around 50, 50 million people who speak English fluently, or around that, and, and maybe around 100 million people who understand English. So, so we have to, if we truly uh, sort of leverage the demographic dividend that we often talk about, I think we need to expand delivery of education differently, regional languages. And I think uh, a digital space provides that sort of a medium to, to deepen uh, the knowledge content which is available. Because if we go uh, through the traditional route uh, and through, through printing of books and all the, the amount of investment that is required may be difficult to sustain. 
um, a digital medium might uh, create better uh, business model for, for that type of work. Okay, wonderful. So uh, we're running out of time. What we will do with your permission, uh, Ambassador, is, is reach out to you with the additional questions that have been asked and get your commentary and, and circulate those back out to the group audience so that they do have answers to their questions. Right. So and I just want one point. I just uh, uh, also request you that you and USISPF uh, share our contact details with all the participants and we'll be happy to uh, also engage with them directly, of course, keeping you uh, always in, in the loop. Yeah, I'm sure they would all value the opportunity to do that. So we'll certainly facilitate the direct communication. So if I may hand over to um, Jobet Abueva uh, from uh, ETS, who's the Executive Director of, of Marketing. But before I do, Ambassador Kamar, thank you very much for your time from, um, from Sunam S4's um, standpoint. You've been a very strong partner in DC and now in Chicago, and we're delighted that they didn't uh, lift you outside of the country and that we retain your uh, good support and partnership here. Um, so thank you very much for today's session. Um, uh, Joba, over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador, and good afternoon to everyone who is involved in today's forum. Uh, as Adrian said, I'm Joba de Bueva, Executive Director for Marketing at ETS. As a former international student and someone who actually attended and graduated from a Midwestern institution of higher education, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. And on behalf of ETS, especially the TOEFL and GRE programs, uh, we are really pleased to be a member of this partnership, the strategic partnership, and to have a chance to share with you uh, a few closing remarks. So in, in listening to the conversation today, which I know is just the beginning of an, um, an ongoing uh, conversation, uh, three, three things did strike me. Um, when, I, when I look at the mission uh, tied to NEP, uh, it talks about equitable and a vibrant uh, knowledge society in India. And from the ETS point of view, that very much uh, dovetails, um, aligns with how we see our mission as a nonprofit that advances quality and equity and education for people around the world. And I know this is um, a sentiment that all the institutions involved here today and others do share uh, as we move forward. Uh, the second quick takeaway is, as the ambassador underscored the how critical research is and how research as a foundation for innovation uh, truly will lead the way forward. And that, that is pretty much what ETS was built on. Uh, we have a cadre of academics and researchers, probably the largest concentration of academics that are dedicated to assessment and learning uh, around the world, uh, who focus on research that is available um, to anyone who wants to engage with it uh, as they consider policy and look to develop uh, their programs around the world. So research is indeed critical. And the last thing is really, at the end of the day, it's all about supporting students, right? And so from ETS's standpoint, we have always had a commitment to students. I know all of you, all the institutions have the deepest commitment to the success of students who matriculate uh, in your respective institutions. Uh, during this time of COVID, we have all been faced with significant challenges. In our case, uh, we were fortunate to come up with a solution to ensure that students are still able to take their assessments. Uh, in this case, we had launched the TOEFL Special Home Edition as well as the GRE general test at home, which enables students in India and around the world to take the test even when test centers uh, were closed. Uh, another example of how we support students digitally is that we offer a lot of test preparation courses. We have a MOOC that's a massive open online course that is available on edX.org. You just have to search TOEFL. And we also, uh, have started an Alexa skill that is available in the US and India. 
So we, we are supporting students in many ways and are committed to continue doing so. So at the end of the day, we, we are glad to be here. We're glad you're all here. And again, this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation and we look forward to those. So thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you very much, Susan, and uh, over back to you. Thank you, Jobert, Susan. Uh, well, thank you, thank you both. And Mr. Ambassador, I want to extend the welcome from the heartland to include a welcome to the Big Ten. And I hope that next football season, you'll be able to enjoy one of the greatest American traditions and go to one of our great college football games. Uh, so, and many thanks to uh, Joe Jobert from ETS, the universities who spoke, the staff at the consulate, and our great partner, Sonam S4. We can't say enough about Sonam's expertise on the India higher education landscape and their partnership in the US-India Knowledge Exchange. And with that, let, let's conclude and I wish everyone a good day. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Bye.